now we are here at VTD interviewing Jose Cordero. Thank you for coming. And the interview begins uh, with Elena asking the questions, please. Okay, Jose, nice to meet you here in Finland. Well, uh, first I would like to uh, know a little bit future studies in Venezuela. So how is it that happening? Is there many universities doing that? And could you tell a little bit about that issue? Well, there was an interest in Latin America, and particularly Venezuela, with the Club of Rome report in the 1970s. But in formal future studies courses, we only began in the year 2000. We created the first course of future studies in one university, and now we have expanded that to four other universities. And hopefully next year, we will actually have a complete master's degree course uh, in one university that we will try to make it open to students from any place in the country. Okay. Uh, what about other institutes and companies? Is there this kind of, uh, that are focused on future studies and future research? Well, yes, there are some uh, institutions that are interested and basically the idea is to move from a strategic planning into future studies. To go not from three to five years, but to go into 10, 20 and 50 years into the future. And that is what I always say, we have to move from a strategic planning into future studies, uh, or as we say in Spanish, uh, prospectiva. That is the name we give in Spanish. From planning to prospectiva. Okay, are you yourself doing this consulting for companies then? Oh, sure, sure. We have been working with different institutions, uh, with the government, with uh, academia, with some uh, private uh, corporations. Okay, good. And uh, you are very interested about technology, isn't that true? Yes. So uh, could you tell where to find these um, uh, new emerging technologies? There is this Patel Institute uh, that has the list for new technologies. So uh, this is one source, but could there be another source? What's good? Uh, yes. For example, two other sources I like are the techcast.org. That web page is handled by Professor William Hallam at uh, George Washington University in Washington, D.C. So that's a very good source. The other one is by futurist Ian Pearson, who is the in-house British telecom futurist. Uh, he has a very, very good review of new technologies every three years. Okay, yes. Uh, is there another? These are the two main, main things that you are following, main sources. Right. Well, and then in terms of um, more general technologies, you know, the transhumanist philosophy follows all of, all of these new scientific and uh, technological developments and how they apply to human beings. Because many of these things are new and changing. Um, it, is, it is hard to know what we will be talking about in the next five years. Just like five years ago, we were not really talking about uh, the stem cells for uh, babies being born. That is relatively fairly new. So I'm not sure what we are going to be talking about the next five, five years from now, but certainly the, in the transhumanist philosophy, we will be covering those ideas. Okay. So what do you think that will be the new, very hot topics in technology in the next 10 years or something? Could, could you say something? Sure. Well, actually, I don't want to say it myself. I prefer to quote people who have been working on that specifically. Uh, three years ago, the National Science Foundation of the USA, they chose the four technologies that will change humanity. And more important than humanity, how technology will change human beings. These four technologies were called NBIC, nanotechnology, biotechnology, infotechnology, and cognotechnology, or cognitive sciences. They said in 2003 that these technologies will converge in the next 20 years, and they will radically change humanity. Okay, thank you. I think that's it. Let's continue. Okay, thank you. Uh, you mentioned these NBIC technologies, but uh, what would you describe as the most promising technologies uh, concerning Millennium Project Global Challenges, these 15 challenges? Would you mention that these nanobio IC as a whole, or could you point out some specific technologies that would, might be the most promising? Sure. Well, I think artificial intelligence uh, is developing very fast uh, after ha having been kind of stagnated during the 80s or the 90s. But now artificial intelligence is moving very fast, and I think it will 
uh, be one of the top technologies transforming um, science and, and, and human beings. The other one is nanotechnology that is starting, and I think maybe in five to ten years it will move into the most interesting aspect, which is called molecular manufacturing, and how we will have the capability of making photocopies through molecular manufacturing, like a Xerox machine, but for a, a different um, even life forms. I mean, for different objects, different uh, uh, different life forms, nanotechnology. Okay. Thank you. Then, uh, when we think about the philosophy of technology, what is, in your opinion, the greatest risk when we think about humans using technology? Well, the risks are very big, and I'm very concerned because we have so much technology that we have the power for the first time to destroy human life. This we never had before. However, technology is not good nor bad. What is good or bad is the use that we give it, uh, but um, that is why we have to be worried about existential risks, because we could, or some people could create nano weapons or bio weapons that could destroy human life. Actually, some people are so concerned about this that uh, they, they are very pessimistic about the future, and they have two scenarios, both pessimistic. The good pessimistic scenario is the destruction of human life total destruction of human life in 20 years. This is the good pessimistic. And the bad pessimistic scenario is the destruction of all life forms, all life forms, all the way to bacteria and viruses. So uh, we really are at the threshold or utopia or destruction of life on Earth and the universe. It, it, it's scary. It's scary. How about uh, what are those solutions, how to prevent those pessimistic scenarios come true? Well, I think we have to keep on uh, pushing for uh, the development of new technologies and uh, spreading the knowledge to everybody so that people see the advantages and that this can be used by everybody. I think this is very important, especially because now the, the world is a split between some countries that use technologies and some countries that do not use technology. And those countries that do not use it are scared, are afraid, they don't want change. And they might use, ironically, some of these weapons to destroy civilization, maybe, because they are against this. So we have to spread the knowledge and the advantages and the benefits for everybody. Awareness of the possibilities, yes. And what is the next killer application of ICT for ordinary citizens within five, five years from now? Do you see any? Sure. I, I think we are going to have personal avatars avatars, which is a word from uh, Hindu mythology, is like we are going to have different representations of ourselves. These avatars will be like our own personal development uh, assistants, like a personal secretary that will filter all your spam messages, uh, that will make all reservations for you, that will know your preferences, that will do your shopping for you. So that will be fantastic. It will be like an artificial intelligence clone. Not a biological clone, but an artificial intelligence clone. I think this is coming fast. Okay. And then, uh, finally, I'd like to congratulate you on, on this futurist prize thing that you have in Venezuela already for six years, as I understand, and the student contest, especially for university students. And uh, each year covering a different issue of these 15 millennium global challenges, and uh, what is the core of this competition? Is it a written essay, and how do you use the results? Yes, um, every year we choose one of the 15 uh, global challenges, and we ask the students to write an essay, a short essay, 20 to 25 pages, about that issue and how it will impact humanity. We have a transdisciplinary jury that reads all the essays and selects the best ones because those students then will represent Venezuela at the International Conference of the World Future Society. So basically, uh, the idea is that the students read about the future, read about new technologies, read about the risks, but also the possibilities, the opportunities of the future, and develop this in, in a very short form, 20 to 25 pages. Okay. Thank you.
Okay, how about this jury, transdisciplinary jury? Does it change every year or is it the same jury? Um, well, uh, they have uh, five members in the, in the total jury. Some of them have changed, some of them have not. But the idea is that we want to have different um, backgrounds, different um, education, architects, uh, doctors, engineers, and uh, humanists. So that uh, students also, because they come from different areas, we have students that are uh, learning law or uh, medicine. So the, the prize is broad enough for anybody to be able to participate. And also the jury has to be broad enough in order to evaluate the work of different students. Yes, and one more question about these uh, essays. Are they publicized, the winner's essays, uh, in journals or in media? Or is there a database where you gather these? Yes, we publish them in Spanish because the works are written in Spanish. Yes. And um, we later on we take them to TV, to radio, and we publish in the newspapers in, in Venezuela like an executive summary of their essays. Yes. Also, we have done it through the World Future Society in the Futures Research Quarterly, which is a quarterly magazine published by them. They have also reproduced um, a summary of the, of the combined work of all the students. Okay, that's very impressive. Thank you very much for this interview, Jose Cordero. Thank you.